Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about war and terrorism. To begin with, the book opens up defining war as an organized armed conflict between nations or distinct political factions. It describes war as a system consisting of components of social institutions, including the economy, government, and education systems, along with cultural beliefs and practices that promote the development of warriors, weapons, and war as a normal part of society and its foreign policy. Again, it begs the question, what does it take to actually go out and make war? In order to make war, you have to think about all the institutions of society and how they interact. Without a good economy, without a strong government, it's very hard to produce the means of production required to make war. Without a government guiding war, it can also be very scattered. When it comes to peace, the book offers various definitions, but again, what does it mean to have a peaceful society is you know, arbitrary. Some people think that peace looks like a world without guns. Other people think that in order to have peace, you need to have guns. And so again, we have some various ideas about what a peaceful society would look like. What would happen if our ability to make war, the war system itself was deconstructed and then somebody engaged in a terrorist attack or a war attack against us and we didn't have the means to be able to protect ourselves. Is that a good society? Again, do we always need some form of the ability to make war? Some system in place to gather up taxes to be able to fund the means of production for the war? A government to organize it all? An education system to teach us and train us? A culture that believes in what they're doing? and values and norms associated with whether or not what they're doing is right or wrong. Again, you get into some great debates about what it takes to make peace. But also it begs the question, is war always going to be a reality of society? Has there ever been a time in human history was when there was not war? Even if the war is within a nation or between nations, has there always been some semblance of war? And I mean, I've studied a lot of history. You know, that was my early love was history. My minor's in it. And I don't know of any time in the human society where some form of violent conflict was not being engaged in, okay? The levels of the conflict, of course, vary depending upon the centuries and the decades we're talking about. Again, back in the day, wars were pretty large when you think about the Pharaoh's time. But then by the time we got to the kings of England, we're talking about small skirmishes with just a few thousand warriors. But then by the time we get into World War I and World War II, we're talking about tens of millions of people. And so again, during the human epoch, you've seen some times where you have large-scale wars. You've seen some times where our ability to make war has greatly reduced. And then you've seen some times where that's gone back up again. Uh, both War systems, war, peace, they both consist of actions and beliefs held by people like ourselves, that these actions and beliefs have serious consequences for individuals, groups, and nations. And so the book kind of discusses the overlap between war and peace in that they both are backed up by ideology and the recognition of the consequences for what's going to happen. When it comes to theories of war and terrorism, again, we introduce this by kind of talking about a systematic approach to war. Is there a standardized cookie cutter approach, which is conflict starts, build up some form of military, engage in some occupation or violent conflict of some kind? What does it take to be able to do that? How do you build the system? How many different institutions are required to be able to contribute to the war effort? I mean, just think about any war. First, the family institution is affected, right? It's the families contributing the people. We need an education system to be able to train people. But then you also get into some of those areas that you know those who are uneducated tended to be drafted more than those who were in college, for example, which then contributes to the inequality of which families are being sampled from to participate in the war. 
You need an ec economy that's strong enough to have enough money so where you can create the factories and have the materials needed to be able to make the weapons that are required to go to war. You need a government to organize and structure the war and to raise taxes to be able to fund the war effort. You know, and so every institution is involved. You have the media, which is portraying the war in specific ways. During some wars, it was considered a sin to be able to talk down. But then during other wars, like Vietnam, you found that the media was definitely speaking out against the war. And so then the media can contribute to the population buying into the war and whether they want to continue to the war. Again, there are a bunch of institutions that are involved in war. Therefore, we take a systems approach to it. When it comes to conflict theory, again, you're looking at how groups compete for resources and also including ideologies. And so how much of war results just from conflict between groups and also the sense of power and domination. Are some wars fought over ideologies and are some wars fought over power and domination? Is it the bourgeoisie trying to gain power over the proletariat? And again, you see that with the Native American wars with the Europeans. Europeans were coming over, land grabbing, using war to put themselves in a dominant bourgeoisie position. But then when it came to World War II, Americans went to war because you know, Hitler was coming. And so ideologically, did we need to step up and you know, create some change? A symbolic interactionist approach to war and terrorism is looking at how we're the ones who create this society. We're the ones who create this culture within which war and terrorism exist. Is it possible to socialize people to not be violent, even if our biology does have some tendencies toward aggressive behavior? Can we create a world that enforces norms of kindness and happiness and being good to each other and helping people get an education if they want to and helping people get a job if they want to instead of going in with tanks and guns? <clears throat> A functionalist approach to war and terrorism, again, first is going to ask, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of the war? What's the purpose of building a system of war? Why do we go to war? Again, you can incorporate some of the psychological reasons into the purpose for the war, of course. The functionalist perspective also looks at war as a social construction, something that we use to achieve a purpose. It serves some kind of a function. So again, what is the function of war? Is it to make war and be an aggressor, or is it for protective purposes? A biopsychosocial approach to war, one looks at the biology of humanity itself, and that all organisms, regardless of your sex, have some violent tendencies. So humans, chimpanzees, for example, it is in our blood, in our genetics, to have the ability to murder. However, so much of our biology is structured by the social context, the social aspects of it, the culture we live in, the norms, value systems, criminal justice, war courts, what is considered a war crime, what is considered genocide. Then the psychology of war, again, is our cognitions. How much control do we have over our biological behavior? You know, we're the ones who are thinking and creating this world. Should we build it in a different way? You know, and again, a lot of that has to do with just the basic cognitions, stereotypes, schematic knowledge, how we approach the world, how we make, how we reason out problem solving. You know, so again, war and terrorism is very much so a biopsychosocial approach, beginning with the biology of the body and the capacity for violence the psychology of cognition and motivation and anger and frustration and all of those factors, and then the sociological social context, the culture we live in, you know, socioeconomic status, purposes, things along those lines. Anthropological approach, again, is focusing on culture, and it's looking at, you know, do we have a culture of warfare? Is a culture of warfare normalized in our modern times, or is it not? Can we rebuild our cultural values to create a more post peaceful world? So again, very interesting cultural approach. The nature of war, the book breaks it down into two parts. It's talking about interpersonal violence, which is small numbers of people conflicting, and then collective violence, which is organized violence by people trying to promote change, resisting social policies or practices that they consider oppressive. And so again, you can kind of look at it as small groups versus large groups.
But again, interpersonal violence, such as you know the Kaiser being killed, you know, can turn into very large collective violence, turning into World War I, when all the European powers decided to fight with each other, and then many other countries got involved in that, also including India and Africa. The consequences of war, the direct effects of war are loss of human life and serious physical and psychological effects on survivors. The book does some demographic statistics and it says out of the 589 wars that were fought by 142 countries sampled between 1500 and 1900, 142 million lives were lost. In the earlier wars, you started to see most of it was the soldiers being killed, but then in the later wars, like World War I and definitely in World War II, where the civilian deaths outweighed the number of deaths by soldiers, you can see that it's not only soldiers being killed, but also civilians. Again, to get into the history of war, we would have to go deep into every single country going back thousands of years. Again, I introduced some of the ideas of the Egyptians, you know, warring with the Hittites or were they friends, you know. You have just so many examples. The Persians coming over, the Greeks, the Romans, the European powers. You have Japan invading China, you know, you have now China turning the corners and starting to invade other places. War has been going on for a long time. And again, we're in a sociology class, so we're not going to sit here and break down the entire history of war. Obviously, we would be here for many, many hours, and y'all would fall asleep. Uh, just kidding. I never fall asleep because it's so interesting. I love studying history. But yes, the war, history of wars are very, very extensive. Um, but... You, when you look at the history of war, again, we're looking at it as a systematic approach to war. Why is it happening? Who is competing with who? What's the effect on society, groups of people? Is it death? Is it mortality? Is it destructions of the cities? Is war associated with poverty? You know, again, these are all huge factors because, yeah, war is associated with poverty. Why do you think Germany went to war again in World War II? It's because after World War I, they found themselves in deep in debt large inflation, absolute poverty, huge numbers of unemployment. So then they decided to build up their war, build up their economy, they go out to prove themselves, and so begins World War II. So again, you know, a lot of factors here with the history of wars. The book talks about weapons of mass destructions, again, looking at nuclear, biological, chemical, or radiological weapons that can kill thousands of people. These have been used in history. Again, the United States dropped a nuclear bomb on Japan twice. You know, gas warfare, mustard gas, for example, was used in World War I. And, you know, so these have been, you know, outlawed. But again, war in any form is terrible. It's just that, you know, the use of a nuclear weapon could literally wipe out the entire world. Some of the consequences of the war, including the idea of dehumanizing the enemy and considering them the outgroup, post-traumatic stress disorder, again, how does war affect you know, the psychological factors, and then biological factors like injuries, disabilities, and death. And then again, we have to look at war as a business. Who's making money on war? How is it affecting the economy of society? Again, Am Americans, we sell, you know, trillions of dollars every year worth of weapons. We make tons of money off the sale of weapons to other countries that don't have the economies and the infrastructure to be able to build weapons of their own. Is that morally acceptable? Again, good questions. Military technology and war. Over time, obviously, weapon systems have become far more developed. You know, the Egyptians, when they had the chariot, that was an incredible advancement in military technology, which enabled them to move quicker across the battlefield, for example. In modern times, if, when, like, in World War I, when people went out on horses and came up against metal tanks, it was very bad. Entire armies were literally wiped out in one single day. So again, nations had to advance beyond the use of the horse, even though millions of horses were used in during wars, if only just to haul goods such as in World War I. I mean, the number of horses that were killed in number one is incredibly extensive. But again, when it goes out to actually fighting in the war, the use of cavalry is no longer used, for example. That was a major advancement. The use of cavalry that enabled Genghis Khan to be able to take over the planet, 
You know, but again, if you came into war in a horse in modern times without, you know, a tank and a, some rapid fire guns, you know, how would you do? So as war and society and technology have advanced over time, so have the weapon systems themselves. We did not used to have giant ships that could sail the oceans. We didn't have aircraft carriers. We didn't have um, planes that could fly in the air. You know, the first use of the tank was in World War I. Okay, we didn't have communication where we can just instantly get on a line and talk to somebody all the way on the other side of the battlefield, for example, which would have really been helpful in the Civil War, for example, when people often didn't even know which side they were fighting and found themselves fighting their own side unbeknownst to them. So again, what's the correlation between the advancement of war, the larger casualties in war, and the advancement of technology? So again, the nature of war has changed over time as society and technology have become more advanced. Uh, global terrorism is defined as the use of calculated, unlawful physical force or threats of violence against the government, organization, or individual to gain some political, religious, economic, or social objective. Again, who is labeled as a terrorist is arbitrary. You know, did the British think the American colonials who were creating a revolution in 1776, did they consider them terrorists? And so again, how we define terrorists is arbitrary based upon the eyes of the beholder. But again, terrorism is often politically motivated and revolutionary motivated, which fits right into the American Revolution in 1776 and the overthrow of the bourgeoisie overlords, the British and the Spanish for the Latin Americans. Again, how do we respond to terrorism is you know, a really good question. When Al-Qaeda, for example, was going on, there were only 3,500 people, but we threw trillions of dollars and huge weapons and entire countries at attacking only 3,500 terrorists. Was that an over response to 9-11, for example, or was that just an excuse to build up the American military so that people that own the means of production can make a ton of money? Again, you have to ask questions. Why did you know Osama bin Laden come over and take down the Twin Towers and try to take down the World Trade Center previously? Is it because Americans had killed 100,000 of Afghan people? The book talks about it in Iraq. You know How many citizens were killed by the US? And I think it's around 40,000 people. You know, are the U.S. terrorists for going into Iraq and, you know, making war and killing civilians? Again, we have to ask the tough questions. And how do we judge? What's the measure of judgment for what's acceptable war and what's acceptable terrorism? You know, was Thomas Jefferson, is he an acceptable terrorist because they won and history makes them out to be heroes? You know, or should we judge that? You know, and so again, what's an acceptable and what's not is completely arbitrary. But again, how we measure it, it's really an ethical question. Repressive terrorism, the book defines as conducted by a government against its own citizens, which is often a twist. We don't think about how we use, you know, our police and our military to subdue people to maintain the political order. Um, but you see that a lot with tyrannical rulers and dictators. Then you have state-sponsored terrorism, which is funded by the government um, to you know, use some smaller group instead of their military to achieve their goals. You see this a lot with Iran. You see that a lot with Russia. And then you have the modern invention of cyber attacks that are trying to take down IT infrastructures. Terrorism in the United States is broken down into four categories by your book. Uh, these are the most at risk uh, of terrorists that we're likely to see in the U.S. Again, foreign-sponsored terrorism on U.S. soil, domestic-sponsored terrorism, foreign-sponsored terrorism, again, like 9-11, domestic-sponsored uh, terrorism, like um, the taking down of the FBI building in Oklahoma City, or pipe bombs. Uh, you have terrorisms and then other nations that might affect U.S. citizens, especially journalists and other people traveling in other countries. And then you have cyber warfare and information terrorism, which is defined as 
aggressive assaults on government computers and IT infrastructure, also the stealing of uh, IT infrastructure and technology and destroying of records. The book talks briefly about solutions to war and terrorism, but again, it asks questions like, is war an obstacle to human in interaction? Would we be more farther along as a society if we weren't constantly going to war? It's kind of like the Greeks knew the world was round. Then, because of plagues and other diseases and war and destruction and the destroying of the library in Alexandria, for example, people forgot the world was round for like 2,000 years, you know. Then they remembered again. If we weren't at war and destroying civilizations, would we be much farther along and have known that the world was round for thousands of years, for example? Uh, passions to war put towards climate change. What if all those $2 trillion we're spending globally on war every year, what if we were to take that money and put it towards solving the earth? What does the future of terrorism look like? Is it going to increase or decrease? Would reducing inequality reduce war and terrorism? Because think about it, why are people most likely to be terrorists? Because they're living in an oppressive system then, and they're more likely to be in poverty. I mean, again, the groups that are engaging in terrorism don't tend to be highly educated, very affluent, wealthy people. It tends to be either people living on the fringe, which you see a lot with American domestic terrorism, or you see you know, very poor countries with no infrastructure, no health care, no education system. And you see higher rates of terrorism in those countries. Again, is peace possible when humans are inherently violent? Will there always be war simply because we are a biological being? Again, these are just some great questions. Thank you so much.